that's it. And there <laughs> we go. It. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, I am Kat and joined by Dan Pepiat. Hiya, Dan. Hello, Kat and everybody. Nice to see you all virtually. <laughs> How are you doing, Dan? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, very, very relaxed. Very good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> even though, even though we're in the middle of a, a possible house move, we're just like, oh, yeah, wow. we're interesting. Well, we, we hope. Very good. Yeah. Mm. So uh, we are on the last day of our retreat, which is very, very yeah. good. So um, I think I think a lot of us have had a really big journey, a real sort of some moments of real reflection, self inquiry. We've been journaling and practicing and doing our own practices to kind of you know work out what really works for us all. Um, so you know it's been it's been really interesting and not easy so um no. we're, oh, we're joined by millie hi millie hello heidi excellent and um, hi emma i'm so glad that you have joined us hi kathy you guys have been brilliant you've been joining us on all of the retreats yay hi iraqi so a, a, a little word of introduction to Dan, if you haven't practiced with him. Dan is, um, when you do yoga like water, that is the name of your um, yoga. Will you give us, yeah. a little, um, give us a little snippet as to yoga like water. What's that about? <laughs> It's a bit hard to to put your finger on, really, because it's a bit it's a bit watery by nature. <laughs> yeah, that's a um, it's um, I, I don't know. I yeah, I get asked that question obviously a lot, um, as do all of the people that have qualified through us, and they probably struggle um, as much as I do to answer what it is. <laughs> it's a it's a very fluid and organic. Um, organism i like to think it's like it just it, it's um it's always evolving there's always different people and styles and things involved not just what we maybe perceive as yoga but uh mm -hmm. people who i believe are live in their practice whether they call it yoga or not whether they're dancers or free divers or whatever um i think that everyone has something to offer um, and, and share um Yes, but the, the I guess the basic principles um, are still there. In that you know we we always have elements of breath work. We always have ele ele uh, the, the largest element is obviously working with the mind. Whatever we're doing, um, there's always movement involved. Um, yeah, so there's all of the elements that you would find in within the eight limbs, for example, of yoga, but not as you might imagine. Maybe they were traditionally. Not that there's necessarily oh. such a thing as traditional yoga, but yeah. Mm. So that's that's it in a nutshell. I like it because, as Raki says, not finding words to describe it is a good thing. It's more of a felt experience. <clears throat> it's like describing water. It yeah. feels a bit watery. And hi, I want to get your pronunciation right. Is it Ertzi? Um, nice to see you here. And hi, Viv. Love Dan's breathing classes and love the retreat. Um, Emma, I'm having a crucial cup of tea after the class to bring me back. Excellent. That me is too. <laughs> Brilliant. We, we are joined here. Now, you ready? What, what I really wanted to talk to you about today, Dan, yeah. is how we can tie, because we've had so many threads during this conversation, during this retreat, we've had little threads of lots of different things have come up for people. We've had lots of folks have been having anxiety mm -hmm. about, um, about coming out of lockdown. And I wanted to speak to you a little bit about managing emotions and how we can feel through our anxiety. And I don't mm. know why i thought you might have something to say about how we just just some thoughts which might be able to help people on this um well i feel very qualified to talk about anxiety because uh i'm probably one of the most anxious people you've ever met <laughs> uh, people don't believe that but um i'm chronically anxious by nature from from like 
as far back as I can remember, mm. probably the age of three, four. I can't mm. think back to a time that I wasn't anxious. And the the effects that that has had on my body over the years are pretty horrible, really, looking back. Now, mm -hmm. quite yeah. far better controlled by my practices and, and understanding, but still um, anxiety is always there. I don't, I don't try and push it away as such. I just, right. I guess I just relate to it differently now. But um, I did have, um, when I was doing like an online chat, uh, at, right at the beginning of the the virus, sort of when we all went into lockdown and everybody seemed to be in a real panicked sort of situation, um, I sort of talked for for quite a while about, about feeling what anxiety actually is, because anxiety doesn't exist. You know, there's no such thing as anxiety. I can't. I can't take anxiety out of the air and put it in a little box or, or look at it or anything. It's not, it's not a tangible thing that you can actually touch or hold. It doesn't doesn't really have any life as such. It's just a, it's just a, an imagined entity. But it does exist very much in your physical body, and that's what people often don't realise that what you call anxiety is is um, something that you've become so conditioned to reacting to in your body. So you have certain change. So uh, something around me. So, for example, things associated at the moment with selling the house in the middle of all of this and not having a house to move to. So you know, it could be effectively homeless in the middle of lockdown. That's all quite weird. But that all um, arises in me. Like none of that has any inherent anxiety about it. That's they're just things that happen. You know, some people couldn't care less but other people will see those as stressful situations that make them anxious and that, that anxiety is something that I feel in my body and and um what most of us do is completely overlook that and we miss that fact so like I could write you down a whole list of things that emerge in my body when I feel anxious mm. and what I actually do is react to those sensations without noticing it, I want to run away from that feeling because it doesn't feel nice. Like my, I feel sick. I get a horrid tingling that, you know, and a flush of heat through my head and my face. Mm -hmm. And basically that's what I mistake and call anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I, because that sensation's unpleasant, I want to, I want to flee from it, which is what we, in yoga we'd call our kleshas, you know, our mm -hmm. ignorance. We want to, we're reversed to, to, to things that we don't like the feeling of and we're attracted to the things that we do like the feeling of. So mm -hmm. when you fall in love with somebody and you get that amazing rush tingling through your body just at the thought of them, there's your klesha there as well. That's your attra attachment. You want to feel mm -hmm. that sensation more. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really simple stuff. And it was something the Buddha Actually, it's one of the Buddha's key teachings. He said it's something like from his deepest meditations that he realized was happening and none of us actually could see was there because it happens like in the blink of an eye. Yeah. And yeah, and the reaction happens to the physical sensation and what we mistakenly do is think that we're reacting to an external uh, thing, like, you know, someone shouting at us or whatever, but someone shouting at us in itself has absolutely no power whatsoever it's just just yeah. sound waves traveling through air for example um yeah and to say that was our root ignorance that's our root delusion our avidya is that we don't see this chain of 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 occurrences we completely mistake it we're ignorant to what's actually happening so you need to start seeing what your physical triggers are that cause you to feel anxious and stop running from them that's a very simple statement uh, but uh that's uh, probably quite a lot of work but i can suggest ways you can start with that okay. hope that's helpful yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I want to i want to know i want to know those ways dan <laughs> <laughs> well you have to be a scientist you know you have to be a scientist and make a study and that's what the buddha always said this is uh i'm not a buddhist but you know i, I embrace any any teaching that works and and uh, for example a lot of what he said on this matter I thought made great sense um, yeah and scientists make a study of things and then they draw logical conclusions from that they don't just go doing practices because someone else told them to and they don't know why they're doing them mm -hmm. uh, that would be madness so it's, it's all well and good to sit and do meditation all the time but if you have no idea what you're actually trying to achieve then you're just sort of killing time um, so your study would be, and this could be with a, 
a notebook that you'd start good time is like when you're in bed yeah, and you wake up in the middle of the night or something and then you're lying there and you start churning over all the things you're worrying about and mm -hmm. you know we're all we've all got a lot of things at the moment that are probably worrying us you know mm -hmm. um so you're churning over this stuff you're starting to feel anxious or stressed or whatever and, and at this point what you need to do is try to sever the the chain of reactions you need to mm -hmm you need to lie there and observe how your body actually feels now because your initial instinct will be to run away from that feeling and try to make yeah. it go away which you might achieve by well typical means would be like having a glass of wine mm -hmm. uh you know watching netflix mm -hmm. uh diving into yet another project you mm -hmm. know this is what people do for their entire lives you know go after another mm -hmm. car buy a new pair of shoes all the things that create a slightly different feeling in our body and move us out of that feeling we don't like it's mm. uh it's so so simple mm. yeah. um so but what you need to do is start stop uh, running away from those sensations and just start allowing those sensations to be present without reacting to them like without pushing them away and you don't have to necessarily like I mean, you can, it's quite a powerful practice, but you know, it's gentle, everything, little steps I always advise. Like, you know, one practice is you invite it all in. So sometimes if I'm feeling really anxious and I'm in, you know, I'm in bed at night and I, I feel awful when I'm anxious, you know, um, sometimes I let, I just lie there and let it completely smother me um, and think what's happening. You know, I'm inviting it in and I'm letting it be there. And, generally nothing happens it just passes away you know you have to be careful because that can be overpowering but um a great step is just to notice you're like okay i'm feeling anxious or i'm feeling anxious what is what does that actually mean mm. and and you start observing okay i think well my head feels really flushed and hot and horrible and i don't like that feeling uh you know there's a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach i don't mm -hmm. like that feeling i want it to go away my shoulders feel all like tingly and pulled up i don't like that feeling mm -hmm. and you start to just suddenly go ah i see i see you i see you anxiety like you're not this hidden phantom i see what you are and the second you look at it it loses its power mm -hmm. it's like kids imagining there's a monster under the bed when they finally pluck up the courage to look under the bed the monster's not there and, and the fear disappears yeah but up to that point there's a monster under the bed in their mind so you have to turn around 180 degrees and look look at it very clearly mm. Mm. yeah i like that and emma has a similar um response i did a meditation that suggested acknowledging the anxiety how it feels and welcoming it it sounded so counterintuitive, but I went along with it and it really took away the the hold that those feelings have. Uh, yeah, I, I think it does because this is something that I've been practicing or attempting to practice when I, um, yeah, have very strong um, aversive feelings, like, you know, suddenly get stricken with anxiety and stress and, you know, something... Uh, um, like the feeling of sadness sometimes just overwhelms me and it's like just kind of getting a bit curious about it is something that I've been doing is sort of trying to dive into the sadness you mm. know what is that sadness How yeah. is, you know just really really feeling it yeah, uh, yeah. which is counterintuitive because you're like you want every bit of you wants to oh I'll just play happy music but actually yeah Diving into these feelings, I think, is really, really important. It's, yeah. And Suzanne yeah. was saying, I find mindfulness meditation very helpful for anxiety and anything else that's happening. Yeah, it's like yeah. It's becoming mindful, but it's becoming mindful of, for me, something that's really located in my body. So it is feeling how that feeling is. Like, mm. what is that feeling? Of yeah. sadness or anxiety or the worry, like how exactly does it feel and where exactly is it? You know, getting, getting a bit um, curious about it. So uh, that's what you have been doing with anxiety. Is that right, Dan? Is that the process? Yeah. Thing? I mean, over the years, I've tried mm -hmm. everything, obviously, and I've been through the whole 
you know i've tried you know all the normal uh ways of getting rid of anxiety and mm -hmm. um and i find that that works and working with my breath as well but the breath is just another physical representation but everybody's breath will change as soon as you you know it, it's just another somatic sensation so your breath will change when you're anxious your breath will change when you're happy mm -hmm. and and what these great teachers said was like when we're anxious we just notice very gross changes in the body like they're very obvious you know when we're ecstatically happy when i'm out surfing and it's a big day and i'm really loving it it's like it's a very obvious feeling in my body but but actually what they say is that um every single action that we make every word we utter every thought that passes through our mind also has a physical attribute to it and there's very very subtle um so the the more we we get used to looking at the gross manifestations in the physical body the more we'll start to go oh my goodness this is happening all day long every thought that passes my mind every action i make every in, you know every time i'm speaking to someone every time i see the you know a yellow t-shirt <laughs> it has a reaction in my body and people laugh at this but it's 100 percent true it's just just because you can't perceive something yeah doesn't mean you can't learn to perceive it that that's it just takes practice um, but the breath is a great one to watch as well the breath will tell you just as much as the the, the gross physical body does i think yeah and mm. so when you're when you're sort of diving into the feeling you're then noticing your breath through it and do you do breath work practices to relieve it or do you just feel your breath as a sort of indicator? Do you change it or not? Um, it, it depends on, on what I'm trying to achieve. But I mean, yes, you, everyone with the breath can bring their physiological state back under control. You know, that's very well known by science, uh, speaking as a scientist. Um, the, the respiratory rate and the depth of the breath and the pace of the breath has this intrinsic link to also like your heart rate um which is called your um like sinus arrhythmia um and yeah so everything in your body is affected by this breath and and i'm sure as m most of you on here know the uh, the breath can change the state of your nervous system so it can put you either into sympathetic nervous system which is like your fight and flight ready to run away or, or or freeze most often actually in our society because we can't fight off or flee from things like emails which upset us so we just freeze constantly and hold our breath uh though it'd be lovely to throw a spear at an email um you know and then we've got the parasympathetic nervous system which is um our rest digest and chill out nervous system and uh, what we want to do is find a balanced nervous system people are quite obsessed with the parasympathetic the rest and digest but actually if you're too much into that then you'll actually you can end up quite depressed and quite lethargic um, just as if you're too much into the sympathetic then you can end up very wound up and tense and stressed so you actually want to find a balance and the the breath tells the brain via something called the the vagus nerves it tells the the brain exactly what state your body thinks it's in so like the the pace of my breath the depth of my breath the quality of my breath is basically saying to my brain this is the state of our current environment we either need to be ready to fight and run away or we need or we're okay like we can just chill out and, and relax um yeah it's just going on all the time so if you're a constant mouth breather if you breathe very rapidly if you breathe into the upper chest for example all these sort of things what you're telling your body is we're under some sort of stress we need to be prepared for action um, i often say it's like rocking a baby you know that's an analogy i use all the time so if you're if you're rocking a baby and you want it to go to sleep you know you rock it like nice and smooth and gently and so on if you want your baby to get excited and start jumping about and you know not go then you rock it and you throw it up in the air and everything else um, don't recommend you throw your babies up in the air but you know we used to <laughs> but you know think of your breath as a baby uh, what you tell your your brain via the breath is how your brain will react to to that circumstance because you're just giving it in information basically to to work on 
really cool stuff like it's lovely that the yogis knew all this stuff years ago and um you know science has confirmed all of it now this is so great oh i can't hear you so okay I, it may be oh. me oh. oh no i can hear you now yep. yeah okay sorry um you know what i find quite interesting is you've got um a 10-day breathwork challenge on movement mm -hmm. from life which is it's more of an exploration into different kinds of breath and how that does, as you say, in a sort of scientific way, just to think about different ways that we can use the breath. Mm. I would recommend that for anybody who's thinking about different breath work because you're right, it's like this is like the yoga breath, which is, but actually there are so many really interesting ways that the, we can use the breath as our ally. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. I think we... Um... You know, I've had I'd talk a lot with people. You know, I was speak. I did a podcast, recorded a podcast a couple of days ago with Rebecca Cole, who's a who was British um, free diving champion, which means she dives without uh, oxygen tanks, and she teaches on our training. And she swam, I think, two hundred meters on one breath. That was her final record before she's quit. So that's like eight lengths of a standard pool, you know, on one breath. So she's a breath expert and she's a yoga teacher. Um, sure. And then I spoke to um, another teacher of ours, Vicky, who's, who was my original first teacher. And, and Vicky got mm -hmm. so into pranayama that that was all she taught. She just pretty much taught pranayama. Um, but yeah, they've all come to the same place, even after all these years, that they're all basically saying, most of these techniques in yoga to do with the breath are just completely unnecessary for, <laughs> for for modern life and for the culture we're in now. They may have worked possibly better back in, you know, in the time that they originated, but now for the nervous state that most of us are in, mm -hmm. like Bastrika and, uh, you know, an awful lot of those powerful breaths mm -hmm. are really counterproductive. Um, Oh, yeah people love them because they you know they actually start you know we there was this obsession sort of i don't know it seems to be fading now thank goodness but it was this obsession that we can take more oxygen into the body by breathing powerfully and all this and it's absolute rubbish scientifically physiologically it's complete nonsense um actually heavy deep breathing powerful breathing reduces your uptake of oxygen um yeah that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is why you get shining skull Kabbalah party you get that feeling of a shining skull and the buzzy thing because you're starving your brain of oxygen you may be doing really heavy breathing but you're flushing out loads of carbon dioxide and actually carbon dioxide is responsible for something called the bore effect and it tells your body to release oxygen so if you're flushing out all your carbon dioxide then you're basically saying to the to to your physiological system ah oh, we're not doing any exercise i'm not building up any co2 i don't need to drop off o2 so your blood is 100 percent, 99 percent saturated with oxygen but it won't let go of it because you're flushing out all of the all of the chemical the carbon dioxide which tells the blood to release the oxygen so uh yeah, yeah. of course you get a sh uh, the feeling of a lovely tingly shining skull yeah. but it's not because it's flooded with oxygen it's because you're starving it of oxygen wow that is fascinating i love it what a shame i really like that practice <laughs> <laughs> well you can still do it i'm just you know it's just it's good, to, good to know what's happening what it does now yeah <laughs> and not it's such a good idea <laughs> well you know you'd have to starve your brain of a lot of oxygen for a long time for it to be dangerous but uh it, yeah it's, that... interesting, it's interesting that that's what it does because it feels like it kind of does the opposite and we have that feeling don't we that a lot of this breath work is increasing our oxygen and right now obviously with covid everybody is very interested in breath work and how mm. we can you know increase the amount of oxygen to the blood and mm. i think that's a very interesting thing and in working out you, just, you can't do it you can't force any more oxygen into your blood. <laughs> it's like we do, you know, on our training, just to prove this point, I have pulse oximeters, which, you know, the things you get in hospital and you clip on your finger and they tell you your blood saturation. And like you pop it on everyone and everyone's 98, 99% saturated with oxygen already. Then we do some powerful breath work and rounds or something and it starts to drop down. <laughs> it's, it, it certainly doesn't go up. You can't get any more oxygen in there. Um, but that doesn't mean that your blood is actually releasing it to where it's needed. Um, 
so yeah i guess one of the things that you know in this yoga like water thing we are very much into busting a lot of myths and nonsense and hokum and that's probably because i was a science teacher for a long time and went to medical school not really into just believing stuff i like to check it out so yeah we're always hooked up to blood pressure machines and pulse oximeters and all sorts of stuff just to oh well wow. that's fascinating i love that one. it is um i i love the way you're incredibly freewheeling as a spirit and creative but actually you're really nailing what's really going on with some of this some of these practices it's interesting um mm. okay so it's looking after our nervous system this was yeah. the key thing for anxiety management and the other thing which um i really wanted to talk to you about dan which is something which i know that you're very very passionate about is creating space in your life like how yeah. do you manage to do less because um dan has written am i allowed to say you've written a little something about doing <laughs> you, you can do they can read it it's free i've decided to give it away oh, for okay. free when this all happened so it's been free since the beginning of the of the coronavirus thing yeah anyone can download it will you will you be able to do a little link in the movers group so that people can download it yeah sure yeah 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 it's a really uh, i've been lucky enough to have read dan's words on the power of doing less um what, what do you call it dan what call what, what? doing less <laughs> <laughs> I call it easy. <laughs> uh, I call it great simplification of uh, a life that doesn't need to be complicated. <laughs> but we're very good at complicating. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's the trouble because, you know, I've been talking a lot. Like yesterday, I was talking about the power of simplification and how we can all do less. But actually, taking the practical steps to creating a life where that's possible is pretty mm. revolutionary right i suppose it is i mean um the less hard i try the easier it seems to be like i just uh, i can't explain it to be honest uh mm. i suppose i you know i spent quite a lot of my life like everybody else with this crazy notion in my head that like what i'm gonna do is work like bonkers hard mm -hmm. and and by working bonkers hard i'm gonna start creating more time because for me like i'm not i've never been one particularly interested in money you know we've had enough to eat and sometimes we've got plenty sometimes we haven't that's just whatever but i've always been very into like my time with I've never enjoyed any sort of work. I don't particularly want to spend my life working. I'm quite happy doing art and being in the water and just doing the things that I want to do. Um, so yeah, I think we. I went through a lot of that, trying to make time by working very hard and it just seemed a little bit counterproductive <laughs> at the end of the day because more work sort of leads to more work. Even when I was doing like sculptural stuff you know and i was doing something i loved making huge sculptures and working mm -hmm. at festivals and pyrotechnics and stuff that people would dream of doing the, the problem is like you work very hard to establish something and then you get quite good at it and then everyone wants to book you for it and you sort of it becomes a bit of a sort of vicious circle you end up being oh this isn't what i was started out like trying mm -hmm. to do especially if you're self-employed obviously and you, you know as everyone knows like you sort of take all the work that comes your way um mm -hmm. so um i don't know i suppose the doing less thing just sort of became a bit of a it, it wasn't necessarily even um a very sort of directed thing if anything it involved letting go altogether of of all of that it's just like let's see what i don't need I thought that was probably a good starting place. You know, what what don't I need? And it's like, actually, we're looking around the house, you know, for things to get rid of before we move, like everyone does. And we're like, actually, I mean, we really, apart from a lot of books, like our house is full of books, but, you know, and my surfboards and kite boards and all that stuff, I need those. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not actually any sort of just superfluous junk you know we, you know so i suppose we don't buy stuff that we don't need very much you know, none of that family do um so that's simple because that instantly sort of means that you've got to earn less money to you know to buy nonsense that you don't need um 
yeah so that's a good starting place what don't i need what do i re what do i really value you know so what are the things i'm not willing to give up that's an important mm. thing because you that's know really, that's really really crucial what do i really value i think that's mm. a pretty amazing question because that yeah. gets to the heart of what how is it that we can all live a more simple life well i guess it's focusing on the things that we really value yeah definitely and if you know We've sort of run in an advanced, well, we ran one session of our advanced training and then obviously this happened, but, you know, we'll pick it up again. But that was one of our topics on that weekend. Um, yeah. We had teachers from all over the country and, there was, you know, of course, mm -hmm. yoga teachers, it's always a tough living. People think it looks great, but it's hard, mm -hmm. especially if you're a class teacher because you're hustling and running from one place to the next. Yeah. And, you know, one of the questions that sort of came up was like, I need more time. I want more time for my own practice and stuff. And, you know, how am I going to make that? Because I'm trying online stuff. I'm trying this and this and, you know, and like my sort of thing, you know, you need to start with a list of what you're prepared to give up. Because like if, for example, your main thing you want is more time, but you're living in London as a yoga teacher paying through the nose for a flat, then the first thing in my mind is you need to leave London because you're always going to find it ridiculously hard to have time and money and pay your rent and everything living somewhere like London because we all know what it's like to pay rent in London. Now, if you say, well, I'm not willing to move out of London, then it may be that London is the thing you're not prepared to give up and you're exchanging that, you know, in lieu of your extra time there may be certain other things you can do to streamline and make a bit more money but i think all of us get to a certain point where it's like i'm pretty much as streamlined and busy as i can be there's no more hours in the day to work you know i need to enjoy myself um it was just one example you know it's not a perfect example but Mm. yeah for us you know i grew up just outside london i love london we lived on the edge of london but we lived in a narrowboat at that time because you know we could afford to live in a narrowboat and still have freedom for example um and that you know we moved a long way from london now um there's no nightlife and you are quite bored in winter but <laughs> but you have a lot of free time so there was a trade-off you know um we that's, that, I'm not saying everyone should move out of London. That would be very logical. But <laughs> but um, it's, my, it's the sort of thing I think people need to think about. It's like, is it realistic in my set of circumstances right now to get what I really think I need, um, you know, without sacrificing something at the same time? That's the sort of place I start. That's really interesting. And I love that. What is it that I'm not willing to give up? I think that's a really mm. interesting journaling exercise. I just wrote that down. I thought, well, I might have a little journal on that one later, because it's yeah. it, it, it's a great, it's a really pertinent question, and I love um, these questions for how is it that we can really solidify the things that are very important to us, so that we can live that life that you know we're not missing out, and we yeah. are to our values, whatever they might be. Do you have any other pointers and tips? I'd be interested in what your lucky yoga teacher trainers were doing in that weekend for how they come to their system of values. Um, I'm trying to think back now. So Ash was very good at this. Who, who so yeah, we were teaching together. She's she's brilliant at the journaling. Look up Ash Bond if you do some journaling stuff. Um, yeah, I think we did do, a, or she she led a session like that where they did some journaling and, and uh, just making notes on, yeah, what they what they, what they really needed, what they were willing to, to give up. Um, oh, I can't think of the other things. If I can, or I'll get Ash to put it on the movers group. Because she, she, she will know. Yeah, some, like, yeah. Really interesting things that we could all have a think about. We've just had a sad face that you couldn't remember them, Dan. No pressure. Uh, the problem for me is I just, I, 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 as I as I think we've probably discussed before, everything that I ever do is just pretty much in my head. I know, I've never written a business plan for for any business I've had, like not a single sentence. I just I just wing it all and see what happens. Um, but at, at the same time, I'd say that one thing that is important is being willing to just let go of everything as well at the same time. And I remember when you came in to teach uh, mm. our business unit at the end of the year last time, um, 
we sort of this came up and i and i said mm -hmm. and i genuinely meant like if for some reason this sort of you know the yoga like water thing or whatever I, it can't fall apart not not the community but the you know the training or whatever mm -hmm. then i just let it go you know i don't hang on to it i don't even push the thing really most of the time it's uh, people just find it if they need to and um i'll just find something else to do you know i don't know what i do about like you know as soon as, if i hang on to it yeah that that's when you're more then your suffering starts again mm -hmm. um i'm not saying you don't work to to you know up maintain and keep what you you you've established don't just let it all go mm -hmm. to pot because you're that lazy but at the same time and if it really feels like the universe has turned a corner and that's not the way to go anymore you just have to let it go and that's what people really fear to do is to let stuff go and then they become trapped by it Mm. Well, that was definitely what happened to me when I was a lawyer. I just didn't want to let it go, even though every single sign of the universe was square peg round hole. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's that letting go. Um, now, I'm just going to turn to you guys, our lovely retreaters. Hi, Alex. I'm so glad that you have joined us. Lisa has got a really interesting question. We're back to the breath, if mm. you're okay with hopping back. Because yeah, maybe you guys can have to think about the doing less and the little value exercises, and maybe you'll ask about that while we hop mm. into the breath. So yeah. what about asthmatics who feel when breathing that they're not getting enough oxygen into their lungs? What awesome. would the best way of dealing with this be? Oh, I love it. This is awesome. Good. <laughs> well, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show that just oh, to prove. Yeah. I've been asthmatic since I was five as uh or younger and who knows maybe tired him in the anxiety but it does seem to run through my family so there's probably some genetics um yeah so bad when i was young my dad used to have to carry me around the house like i remember because i couldn't move walk or talk or anything you know at times but um yeah under control now uh uh so still asthmatic but i pretty much control it myself i do take uh the Medita uh, medication meditation i take meditation for for my asthma um but i went for my asthma checkup like uh, just before mm. lockdown and i went to the nurse and she said um she said um you know that we can tell by looking at the computer that you're not picking up your asthma medication as frequently as you're supposed to and i said uh yeah i'm sure you probably can tell that and she said well I, i'd like to know how how you think you can keep it under control and i said oh i control it mostly through breath work and uh, she sort of went oh oh yeah well let's have a look you know let's do the peak flow i don't know if anyone's ever done that you have to blow mm -hmm. into a thing really hard and it and it shows what your lung function is basically or your, uh, anyway and i blew in it and it came out like 650 which was like right top of the chart for for my age and weight and it shouldn't have been because like they've done x-rays on my lungs and they're all sort of hyper large as in a lot of asthmatics they're probably scarred and all sorts inside um but um yeah so this is a great question and uh, like uh um let me just read it again what about for asthmatics who feel they're breathing they're not getting enough oxygen into the lungs what would be the... so that that feeling depending on exactly what sort of asthma you've got you know is is due to either congestion mucus like uh, build up in the in the airways of the lungs or in the the trachea itself but probably in the bron like bronchioles where it gets smaller and finer and it starts branching into the lungs so you might have that sort and i get that quite often that mucus and if it's in there then it's actually hard for the um, gas exchange to occur so when you get right down into the lungs you get those little alveoli you know like the little cauliflower shaped things there's billions of them and um the that there, there are little capillaries around those alveoli, tiny blood vessels, and, the, and then the gas moves in and out through the through the wall of the alveoli because it's so thin, gas can pass through it. Um, so, but if your airways and, and like down towards the alveoli are all clogged up, then you're going to have trouble with the gas exchange. So, um, you need to sort of aspirate your entire. Well, I'm saying you know, I can't give you a diagnosis on that because I've never met you. Uh, I work talking from my own experience. When I feel like that, I need to sort of what, aspirate my entire lungs. So that looks like for me making sure I'm breathing not only into the belly, but into the, the ribs. And I'm getting what we call lateral costal expansion, which is expansion out to the sides, not, not up. Uh, so I want this sort of this 
belly to start expanding. Then I want the ribs to expand outwards. And then I want the, right at the end of that, there might be a little lift as well. So what I've done is inflated like the whole lung and then I take in a nice long, just slow, relaxed breath and let that pour out. And, and what you'll find is if you get the rib cage really working and the diaphragm really working and the, the lungs really moving, after a while you'll sort of probably start to <coughs> and you'll start to clear some of that junk up. You actually often see this and I, from people I've worked with, but often in yogis, bizarrely, if you become overly dominant at belly breathing, which is obviously often taught in, in yoga, which is cool because it uses the diaphragm. But if you become overly dominant belly breather, you can become quite congested in the upper chest because you're not aspirating the upper part of the lung as well. You're only working in the deep lung. So that's one thing. Um, if you suffer from um, like restriction of the airways, which I do as well, especially if it's cold, that's a killer for me um there that's like a sensitivity to to cold air or sensitivity to um pollutants or dust or uh, animal you know dander or whatever it is for you uh, could be some foods then your your airways are restricted now there's a really interesting thing and again look into it yourself because it works for some and not for others but there's a a russian breath technique called Bateko and Dr. Bateko was a cardiac specialist in Russia in I don't know like 50s 60s or something and um, he's no this is far out but it all makes complete sense and actually they teach it uh, physios teach it on the NHS now so there's obviously something in it um, he believed that because in the modern world we were chronic hyperventilators in other words we breathe too much we breathe too fast and we like we breathe with our mouth open and it comes back to what i was saying about we lose too much carbon dioxide <sighs> you watch people and there's so many people have got their their mouths open like this or they're just breathing up here very rapidly you're gassing out carbon dioxide and one of the in, one of the most important uh, properties of carbon dioxide is that it's a really powerful muscle relaxant um, yeah. So if you're purging lots of carbon dioxide, your muscles aren't actually able to relax. And um, uh, this is brilliant. If it's, you know, I, I love this theory. And his theory was that some asthmatics have actually adapted to that hyperventilation. And that restriction in the airways when they close up is an effort by the body to try and conserve carbon dioxide and to stop you losing so much. Um, and that restriction would be a byproduct of losing so much carbon dioxide anyway, because, because it's a muscle relaxant. If you lose too much, then the muscles will go into spasm. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So like when I'm um, very tight, for example, I actually try to breathe uh, less. That sounds really counterintuitive. Um, and again, I'm certainly not a medical doctor. Never, I never made it to qualification, and uh, I can't advise you over the phone. But it's you, you can find Bateko teachers out there, and you can go to your doctor, and you could even ask if any of the local physios are trained in something like Bateko or breath re-education. You know, I do one-to-one -one breath re-education with people, mm. just getting them to breathe properly, basically. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Look into it. I would read about all these things. Uh, certainly uh, I mean I, like I say I still take my asthma pumps and you should never ever stop taking those and never not have them with you that would be completely bonkers um, but I am on the bare minimum like that a child should be on pretty much of asthma medication and and to be honest my asthma like got I don't know probably because I surf so much I'm in the water especially through winter my asthma is slightly worse than it was in my 30s but that's not unusual either because you know all of your um, all of your material in it's in your body starts to lose its elasticity as you get older basically so you're, you're constantly working against this sort of um, build up of fiber or whatever you want to say you know uh, but yeah so there's a lot to think about there um, yeah there up. is from Bateko, I'd read well, up well, when, when you say um, read up we've been asked Raki's asked do you have recommendations on books to read oh i've got millions of books to read i tell you a great one that just came out last week um and it's a good summary of all of these things actually um it's called breath can i write it in the comments i can't comment no um 
No, you have to, I think you have to do it. After yeah, I do it in the group. group. Yeah, it's called Breath, and it's by a guy called James Nestor, who used to write for the New York Times. Um, mm. and it's it's only out on hardback or Audible, so you can get it as a. I got it as an audio book the day it came out. And, it's great. It's a good summary. I mean, there's nothing new for me in there, but if I'd been new to this sort of stuff, I'd have thought, well, yeah, that's a great summary of sort of everything that I've learned over the last 10 years, probably. You know, it uh, sums it all up really well. So Breath by James Nestor, very good. Uh, he did write a previous one called Deep, which was pretty cool as well, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, and as Emma has pointed out, it's interesting. They've been treating COVID patients lying on their front so that the breath mm. is the back of the lungs. Isn't that fascinating? I love it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Because they say in Boteco, for the worst place to sleep is on your back. Um, yeah, and I, from memory, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure they say on your front is best. Wow, mm, not very good. For, not not good for the face wrinkles, though, Dan. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's too late for me on that one. <laughs> too, too late. Yeah, I, I, I same thing. Mum, uh, hi, Mum. Lovely to have hi, you here. <laughs> Dan, I do know that when I'm stressed or suffering physical pain, if I breathe in slowly and cal calmly, it seems to alleviate my pain. Is that all in the mind? Um, what, that it seems to alleviate the pain? Mm. Um, quite, well, pain is a fascinating one because pain is, although, although obviously you're getting stimulation from nerve endings that are signaling that you've got pain, mm -hmm. um, pain an awful lot if you look at the studies an awful lot of what we perceive as pain is actually in the mind <laughs> which is why you get these fantastic pain clinics nowadays you know for people with really bad chronic long-term pain rather than just keep dosing them up on more and more painkillers um, they sort of teach almost like mindful practices to start to explore what the pain actually is and they have done some amazing studies on pain where they've gone like a really large percentage of pain is mind generated and only a certain percentage is actually physical like stimulation as such um so quite possibly yeah you become maybe just more centered back in your true self and and not so attached to the thought of pain that you're creating um yeah fascinating and it um, is fascinating. yeah lisa thank you i've recently been re-diagnosed with us uh, after having not taken medication for 20 years. Okay. Yeah, the Boteco about 20 years ago with my son. Mm, and I came across my notes. Yeah, good. Well, um, I hope maybe this might help remind you. Yeah, me. Look, look into it. it. You know, it's 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 not the only technique out there, but um, it's, everything's worth a try. I always say dip your toe into anything, you know, like you don't dive off the end of the diving board and find you can't swim. That's my general advice with everything. Dip your toe in and, you know, if it feels okay, then you go in a little bit deeper and try things out, but you never just plunge in, you know, completely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm, now, one, one thing that you said, Dan, which... Um, I would like because I like a neat full circle. So what we have been talking about is breath work and how that can really help ease our anxieties. And we've also been talking about the power of simplification, simplifying our lives and really examining our own values. And a very interesting thing that you just touched on is that you said breathing less mm. is a good idea. Yeah. This is, I, I just, before we all go, I just think, well, here we are all thinking about we're doing less, simplifying our lives, breathing less. Talk, talk to us all about that. What's that about? Breathing less. Well, it, it's, it's probably more to say, what I should say is breathing adequately. So, like, as you might remember, like in my breath work, whenever I work with the breath, I do intensives on breath and, and we do breath on the training. I have a thing called aquas and it's just like a, a mnemonic for adequate 
is the first one like breathe adequately and and by adequately i mean breathe no more or less than you need to so that your breath should always exactly match your requirements at any given time so for example you might find we find that if if we had like Dan, we've lost you. This is a disaster. Just when we were getting some really, really interesting. Oh, there you are. You're back. That's the most important thing. That's okay. I don't know what happened. Perhaps my computer got bored. <laughs> my, right. my, my phone cuts off after about three minutes. It's obviously decides I've had enough talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just see if your computer will let you finish this one off we'll see if we can then take final questions and then we'll round it up can we see if we can do that yeah we could do that so where was i adequate yes so what yeah if we had 20 people we'd probably find 19 of them were breathing more than they needed to at, at rest um rebecca at the moment um, who I touched on earlier um, is working with marathon runners at the moment um, something we talked about a couple of nights ago and she's working with marathon runners to get them to breathe less whilst they run as well um, to breathe only in and out through their nose you know something that a lot of them are really resistant to but I've worked with runners as well and and the same thing and they go away and they struggle with it because it's really tough and then they come back to you like a year later and they go, oh my God, it's changed my running completely. I was over breathing while I was running, you know? And, um, <clears throat> so breathing adequately, yeah. The second one is breathing quietly. Um, and breathing quietly means that, number one, you're breathing through your nose. And if you can't breathe through your nose, then I'll tell you how to breathe through your nose because everyone can breathe through the nose. Um, if I said, because of the asthma pumps I took and everything else, I also took steroid nose spray for the best part of 25 years. God knows what that did to my nose. <laughs> I've definitely got all sorts of polyps and everything else up there. Um, and eventually I just decided I would stop taking them and only breathe through my nose ever um, because my body will not let itself die. Like if your body, if your nose is bunged up and you refuse to breathe through your mouth, your body will cause your nose to open. It will not let you die because you're being an idiot, basically. Um, so there are really easy techniques to, to clear your nose. Even if you've got the thickest flu, cold hay fever, I could clear your nose in less than five minutes, almost guarantee it. Um, yeah, so if anyone wants to know about that, it can. I think it's probably on my breathwork challenge, actually. I reckon. Um, what else? Uh, that's quiet. Oh yeah, and quiet is also like not overly moving any parts of the body that aren't necessary for your breathing. So if you're one of these people that's always taking big sighing breaths or, and lifting your shoulders or tensing your neck when you're breathing, that's not necessary. Unless you're running away from a tiger, you, you don't need to be breathing that that hard. Uh, what are we on? AQ. U is unattached. And that's what we talked about right at the start of this chat. So your breath, you train it to become unattached to your emotional state. Um, yeah, exactly what we were talking about. And there are really good techniques for doing that. You put your body in stressful positions and then you train your breath to be, become normal. So like you would put it in a stress position like that, you know, like a crucifix or a plank hold or something you don't like. And you would hold it for as long as you possibly could. And you would observe your breath and try to keep your breath smooth as a as silk through that knot. <laughs> not like getting all staggered and jagged so you train yourself through uh, physical stress to not respond to emotional stress and there's a lot on that in something called sistema which is another russian breath work uh, training it's also a martial art um really peculiar martial art if you look it up on youtube you see some really odd stuff but um yeah they're cool it's a, the whole the whole martial art um is based all around the breath so they learn how to breathe properly first and then they learn how to defend themselves so that's the unattached a q u a and then the next a would be abdominal which means that the breath is driven by the diaphragm because the diaphragm is the is the 
the muscle of respiration um just like the nose is the organ of respiration that you know there's a really common saying in Bateka. they say like you wouldn't try to to eat through your nose so don't try and breathe through your mouth <laughs> <laughs> so we use the diaphragm and but like i also touched on earlier you can use the diaphragm to breathe not only into the deep lung with a belly breath but you can use the diaphragm to breathe into the middle and upper part of the lung as well um, it takes a bit of learning, but that's something else that I work with. Uh, and it's a really efficient, effective breath because the diaphragm is a thin muscle and doesn't require loads of energy to contract. Whereas like your shoulders and your intercostals, which intercostals are fine for breathing, but they're still quite big muscles compared to the diaphragm. So from an efficiency point of view, breathing with the intercostals and mainly breathing into the ribs is really inefficient. Breathing up here, which we call apical breath, a lot of like shoulder traps, neck stuff going on. That's super inefficient because you're burning loads of energy to get air in and create new energy. It's bonkers. It's, I'd love to think of a great analogy for it, but I'm sure there is one. Um, so, yeah, so the that A is the abdominal breathing very efficiently. And the last one is selfless, selfless breath. And that's where you just merge with the breath and the uh, you become the breath. There's no breather breathing. There's just just the breathing. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably for another day <laughs> yeah yeah that, that that sounds like um that might involve uh, another course <laughs> <laughs> well the, 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 the Taoists say they say the perfect man breathes as if he's not breathing wow you know that's um you, you shouldn't be able to see it the samurai used to have this amazing test to to know if you had finished your training as a samurai and they used to hold a feather under the nose and uh if you could if you could breathe without even fluttering the feather then you uh you were ready and it's so interesting and i've had a couple of thoughts that have come up about that first one is well it's very opposite to the ujjayi breath right like you don't get any more so that's the sort of traditional yoga breath that you breathe in a mm. ashtanga practice the um, yeah. curious breath which is noisy and um uh. it's quite it, it does take a bit of effort doesn't it to come up through that throat and it feels it lovely but <laughs> yeah i mean we stop i mean I, I stopped uj a long long time ago and we we never we don't teach it on the training it's not something we ever advise um you know it never was a part of asana practice ever until like very very recently i think probably the 60s or 70s probably to do it but have you don't quote me but i'm pretty sure that's that's right um you know ujjayi breath was a pranayama practice a standalone breathwork practice it, it, it never had any particular attachment to movement um yes it is a focus because you can hear it but actually there's an awful lot of constriction and resistance going on <laughs> i really dislike it and i hate hearing it as well like, i just don't like hearing people breathing like that in class it doesn't sound right to me it's not natural it's not normal and it's certainly not relaxed so like if you were supposed to breathe like that then you'd be you'd be born breathing like that but you aren't so you probably aren't supposed to <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's my take on it you know uh, yeah. as, ba as babies we we breathe perfectly as babies and then our breath becomes corrupted in infancy normally or in you know and if we were meant to breathe with a really rasping breath at the back of the throat then we'd come out of the womb breathing in that way and we don't mm -hmm. Well, I think as ever, Dan, you sort of break things up down into a very sim simple level, which is um, easy to understand, but it also reminds us that actually just think about things in a very simple, straightforward way. Um, yeah, we've been asked, uh, Sandy, what do you think of ocean breath? Ocean breath is your jai breath. It's another way of saying your jai breath. Um, Darth Vader breathing, breathing is the other way. Yeah, I think we know Dan's thoughts on ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like of everything that I always say, it's just my thoughts. You know, if it feels great to you and you enjoy it, then do it. You know, it's not for me to tell anybody on the planet what they should do. I don't mm. let anyone tell me what to do and I'm certainly not going to tell anyone else what to do. So if you enjoy it, if it works for you, then do it. Uh, mm. And at the point where it doesn't work for you, stop doing it. Don't hang on to it. Mm -hmm. Simple mm. as that. You know, it's, not, oh. it's not, not rocket science. It's really simple stuff. Oh, it's pretty revolutionary, though, because this is all about 
what we were talking about before really is um, taking sovereignty, having the space to take sovereignty of our lives, our bodies. Um, oh, Sandy said, yeah, it's Ujjayi, but gentler. Yeah, and quieter, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's good, if you enjoy it, do it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's generally my sort of my go to on everything. If you like it, do it. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. <laughs> so don't oh, listen yeah. to anyone else who tells you what to do. I, I, I always enjoy our chats. <laughs> Bring things <laughs> into a crazy level. Do you have any other um, passing thoughts, comments on? Because this isn't the last day on our retreat. Oh, um, right. Okay, cool. Yeah, we've all been on quite a journey of self inquiry, oh, right. processing. Yeah, Dan, you're not big into um, the social media being following us. <laughs> I know. So I deactivated my Facebook. I only reactivated it for this. So, um... oh, yes, yes. <laughs> but um, we've all been on quite a journey, and we are looking for ways that we can return to um, an, a different form of life, not mm. returning to normal. I just want, no. do you have any other passing thoughts? And I'll just leave a few seconds <clears throat> to have any final comments for Dan while you maybe give us some final pearls of wisdom about how we sure. can take the things that we have learnt. Yeah, I'd love to. Like, I'm always full of something to say. But like, I do take what you... You know, it's all well and good doing retreats or anything, but if you don't implement what you learned from them, then it was a complete waste of time. It's like, you know, the, the scientists doing all this research on, on the virus and, you know, if they did all this research and then didn't implement what they found, it would be apropos of nothing. So if you come to some discovery that you aren't happy with the way your life is or what you're doing or whatever, then change it make it change you know um there's a great one of my teachers says um we're free to try and change whatever we want we have that absolute freedom um if the universe decide if the universe you know isn't going to steer you that way you haven't got to worry anyway because it won't let you go that way uh you know and if the universe is going to steer you another way you're free to try and stop it in any way you want but if that's the way you're going to go then there's nothing you can do to stop that happening so in so you should try to you should try to do whatever you think it is that you should be doing but let go of the outcome if that makes any sense because if it's going to happen it will happen and you can't stop it and if it's not going to happen there's absolutely nothing you can do to force it to happen yeah. Um, so it's finding this balance, which you know we call like Wu Wei in in uh, in uh, Taoism. It's like effortless effort, uh, actionless action. You're doing stuff, but it's without. Yeah, it's so hard to describe to the Western mind. <laughs> it really is because because they misconstrue it as being lazy. Um, you act, but but you're not attached to the results, and and you're you're very. You try to be very tuned into the subtleness of the of the universe, like the universe. You know, I sound a bit like a hippie now, but I truly believe in this sort of stuff. Like the universe has a certain flow to it; it's flowing you, it's pulling you in a certain direction, and you are either flowing with that, and it will fit. You'll know when you're flowing. Like you knew, didn't you, Cat? When you, you were a lawyer, and that wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. you were going against the the, the grain of the wood. You know, and, and when you're resisting the flow, you know that because you feel goddamn miserable. Yeah, yeah. Like, so if you're feeling really miserable with your lot right now, it, quite chances are you haven't given in to the to the river and let it take you where it needs to take you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we all resist because we're scared. You know, we're all scared to to let go. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. You're scared. Everyone's mm -hmm. scared. Um, but from my experience. Oh. Uh, when you jump in and see where it goes, life's quite exciting. It's like, just let it unfold. You know, that's where the, the it's in the mystery, isn't it? I don't know. Like I said, we're selling a house. We've got no house to move to. We have no idea exactly where we're going to end up, but we were at a point where we've done this sort of weird stuff enough times that it's like, it will take us exactly where we're meant to be at that time. I'll just let that unfold. Whether I perceive that as good or bad is irrelevant. Because everyone often thinks, oh, yes, well, the world will turn it all out perfect for me. But 
that may not be the path the world has got for you. That you just have to accept what it gives you. I'm afraid. <laughs> Sometimes I, I drive to the beach. You know, I've driven 45 minutes to, to scope out a perfect wave, and there's no wave there. And I try to just turn around with complete equanimity and drive 45 minutes back home again. I don't. Sometimes I get there and it's awesome wave, and then try to go out with complete equanimity and not be overexcited. You practice with the little things, and then the big things are much easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I like that. I like that, Dan. I think those are those are really sound thoughts and letting go of the attachments because I know during this course a lot of us have been very. I have been very rigid about, I want to have this, you know, making my firm intentions about how I would like things to be. And I think being able to let go of the attachments to the outcome is the most beautiful way that we could round off this retreat, in my humble opinion. I really think it is because we all have good intentions and we all have done a lot of exploring and inquiring and we're doing the process. Mm -hmm. And I think to just, as you say, to carry on doing the work, otherwise it was a waste of time, but not necessarily be so fixed to the outcome. I love that. Effort without attachment, so says Alex. And the lovely thing, Emma, is you've just given Emma permission to let go of um, the way that she is teaching or maybe to think differently about it. Um, yeah. Wait, uh, she's what teaching yeah teaching yeah uh, teach, teach whatever you feel is right emma mm. don't ever try and please anybody with your teaching like you teach what you feel and that's that mm. if they like it they like it if they don't they don't it's not your concern at all i love it <laughs> I, uh, it's what we say to everyone on our training and it seems to work for everybody it's like mm. don't 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 indulge those thoughts you know mm. we think we know that was one of the Buddha's great sayings, wasn't it? We, the problem with humans is they think they know. <laughs> and we have no idea whatsoever. Uh, just let it, just let it unfold. There's, there's to see, see, the problem is that we're control freaks because we think we know how things should be. Yeah. And we think that freedom comes with control, but actually control is completely isolating. The freedom comes with letting go and just accepting what comes that's that's real freedom i just like just gonna see what happens there's a lovely can i read something yes please right i'm gonna read you something from literally my favorite book um it's what's second your favorite book. book second book of the Tao. uh mimi recommended the first one to me mm -hmm. and then um and then this one that came out i don't know it's awesome anyway but the writings of Zhuangzi, and I'm saying she'll she'll tell me I pronounced that wrong. Can you, I'm sure. can you um, write the name of it because I can't see how clear that oh. it is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I I write that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's just you know the the thing with Taoism, it's just aphorisms really mm -hmm. a lot of the teaching. So there's not any specific like do this, do that, which is why I love it. It doesn't tell you anything to do. There's no practice or anything. So anyway, here we go. I'll read you this out. This is a Penumbra said to Shadow, when the Tao moves, you move. When it stops, you stop. Don't you find it depressing to have no power of your own? Shadow said, on the contrary, with no decisions to make, my mind is always at ease. All I have to do is follow. You can't imagine how much freedom there is in just going along for the ride. Penumbra said, but how can you know that its decisions are right? Where do you find your trust? And Shadow said, whether I trust it or not, whether or not its decisions are right, when it moves, I move. So I might as well trust it. <laughs> yeah, that sums it all up. <laughs> it, does, it does sum it up better than I could round this off and possibly even better than amazing Dan Pepiat could. I have so appreciated your time here, Dan. Thank you. Hey, you're more that. than welcome. You know I like Thank to ramble you. on. Thank you for having me. Well, it. It, it's yeah. been such a pleasure and everybody thank you so much for um bringing your whole selves to the last 10 days and being happy to go through this process of self-inquiry um with us all and you know there'll be things that you think are rubbish there are things that you think mm, and there'll be things possibly that might have um 
might have worked. So, and I hope there's been a little bit. I'm glad that a few of you are saying this has a, been a good discussion. I'm I'm glad. And thank you, Raki, for putting in the towel. Thanks, Trans Raki. Thank you. A lovely ramble. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, retreat, Millie. It has been brilliant. So thank you very much. Let's because even though the retreat is over, we are always still going to be here on the Movers Group. Some people more active on Facebook than others, Dan. <laughs> but we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> if you've enjoyed listening to Dan, you might like to listen to his podcast, which we've done, um, which was a, oh, yeah. another good ramble. Um, yeah, I always, always enjoy spending time with you. Dan does the Yoga Like Water Teacher Training, which I thoroughly um, recommend. It's it's yoga teacher training unlike any other that I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> For good and bad. <laughs> so, listen, thank you all very, very, very much. And Thanks, everyone. Uh, all of us, keep the conversations going. Let's keep supporting yeah. each other. Definitely. Well done. And put it into action. Indeed. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.